Greetings! This is the second video in this series, and like the first disclaimer, things are going to get a lot darker as we go through. Uh, it's probably going to even out by about the third or fourth video, so it's going to get worse, folks. It's going to get a lot worse. Let's begin with Aaron Zeb. Interesting. I filmed this whole thing and realized I must not have been hitting record. Not entirely sure. In 1618, Aaron Zeb was born. He was one of four sons of Shah Jahan. In 1626, Shah Jahan had tried to lead a rebellion against Jahangir. It was unsuccessful. To get out of being executed, Shah Jahan ended up sending Aaron Zeb as well as several other relatives to be hostages as part of his pardon. Aaron Zeb received an excellent education. He was fluent in several languages to include Hindi. This was very important because the Mughals controlled a large chunk of India. During his early adulthood, he was at a military camp when a war elephant became enraged and stampeded. Aaron Zeb managed to dodge it and stab the elephant with a lance. Shah Jahan was very impressed by this, and he called him Bahadur, which means brave. In 1635, Aaron Zeb was sent to put down a rebellion. He was successful, and as a reward, his father made him the Viceroy of the Deccan. In 1636, Aaron Zeb also gets married, and he falls in love with a slave girl. She died a few years afterward, and this devastated Aaron Zeb to the point he was writing poetry. It's very interesting when you think about like some, some of the stories that come later with Aaron Zeb that he was writing poetry. In 1638, as part of Shah Jahan's crackdown on the Portuguese, Aaron Zeb was sent to attack a Portuguese fortress. He was defeated. Around 1644, Aaron Zeb was accused of insulting his father. Now, there are two different versions of the story. In one, he walked into the inner palace wearing his military gear, basically his street clothes, and he wasn't dressed well enough. In the other one, he apparently wore wealthier clothing than his own father, and that was the insult. Either way, he ended up losing his post as viceroy. In 1645, Shah Jahan realized that Aaron Zeb was depressed about this. Shah Jahan, from his own personal experience, knew that he did not want his military leader's son to have any anger toward him, so he made him governor of Gujarat. In 1647, he became governor of Balkh. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing it right. It's a city in Afghanistan. He was actually replacing his brother, who was losing against the Afghan tribes. Uh, Shah Jahan then later on tries to negotiate with them by giving them more land. Doesn't work, they end up taking Kandahar. In 1649 and in 1652, Aaron Zeb tried to retake Kandahar. He was defeated. Uh, later on, his older brother he sent, and he's also defeated. Aaron Zeb becomes Viceroy of the Deccan again. And he is... He feels kind of let down. Uh, the, the land's not that... He doesn't have that great of a tax base. There's not many resources. Uh, as a prince in the Mughal Empire, he needed to make money so he could build an army on the event that his father would die. Because there would be a civil war. Shah Jahan thought that Aaron Zeb could actually reform Deccan. He could make he could make it successful. And he did. He ended up building an army. And he went to conquer more lands. Shah Jahan didn't really want him to do that. So he negotiated with the people that he conquered to give them their land back. This probably did not make Aaron Zeb very happy. Uh, so there were three other sons. Darashiko, 
was the oldest one. And then there was Murad and Shah Shuja. Darashiko was the favorite son. He was in charge of Shah Jahanabad, which, I mean, it's his father's city, the city named after his father. When Shah Jahan became ill, that's where he went. More than likely, based on the record, he probably had either a UTI, possibly uh, bladder stones. It was, any of these conditions could be treated in the Mughal Empire. Uh, the medicine was up to par in this time period that these were treatable conditions. There are several medical treatises which list ways that are actually a lot better than what you'd think for the time period. I wouldn't say modern, but definitely decent. The three brothers were suspicious. They did not trust their older brother. They thought that their father had died and that he was just pretending he was alive to stall the inevitable civil war. In 1658, Shah Shuja attacked first. And he was defeated by the combined army of Dara and Shah Jahan. Aurangzeb decided to unite with his brother Murad, and they went after the army together. And they were victorious. Uh, Dara apparently left his army, chased down Shah Shuja. He didn't have many people left, but he still considered him enough of a threat to keep to let his army go chasing him. They, Aaron Zeb ends up taking Agra. He has his father imprisoned in the fort of Agra. And he turned on Murad. He had Murad imprisoned. He accused him of killing a tax collector. And this apparently happened years before. He ends, up going, he ends up going after Shah Shuja. He defeated him again. And he, Shah Shuja went on the run. He ends up leaving Mughal territory. He ends up being hunted, hunted down by local leaders, and he was killed. Dara was accused of heresy. Dara still had a bit of an army left, but Aranzeb decided to pull, use religion and accuse Dara of committing heresy. So, in, six, in August 10, 1659, he was captured and bound by his own generals and his severed head was sent to his father, Shah Jahan. January, oh, December 4th, 1661, Murad was finally executed. And then January 22nd, 1666, Shah Jahan died. By this point, Aranzeb was already emperor. Aranzeb was very devout in his religion, uh, but he also valued secular law over Sharia law. That said, his rule, there's, it's a very gray area. Uh, on one hand, he supported some temples. On other hand, he destroyed others. If he found out that people were trying to convert Muslims into any other religion, they'd often be executed. In 1679, he reimposed jizya, which was a tax on non-Muslims in lieu of military service. He most likely did this to make money. It wasn't really so much based, like, from his point of view, it wasn't about religion, it was about money. It was waived for any area that was hit by, let's say, an earthquake, floods, war. They wouldn't have to pay it. Women, children, elders, religious leaders, and the disabled, they were all exempt. And it was based upon how much you could actually pay. Of course, it came down to the discretion of the local tax collectors. Most of his reign, you see, you don't see the sorts of things like the Taj Mahal. He focused more on building his military, military technology, maintenance, infrastructure. He wanted so better roads instead of beautiful art. He allowed the French to build a factory in Surat in 1667. And in 1660, in 1686, the East India Company decided they wanted to have a little bit more of a monopoly. <music> September 3rd, 1681, Sir William Hedges was sent by the East India Company to be governor of the Bengal Agency. 
the East India Company was dealing with corruption. This was bad in the eyes of the Mughals. This was bad in the eyes of England itself. There were... This is the start of modern capitalism. A lot of the rules had not been written yet. The East India Company, at various points, was involved in what we'd call today insider trading. Uh, such things as... They were getting most of the news from India before the rest of the country was. So, for instance, if there was a ship lost at sea, they would get word before anybody else. And they and some of their more connected investors, such as those on Parliament, those in the royal family, they would sell off their stock before anybody else got word of it. And then when they got word of it, they'd sell off their stock and then same people would be able to buy all that stock back, even more, dirt cheap. Sometimes they would create rumors if it wasn't going to happen in a normal way. This is how they were building on their investments. Well, there was also, the eventually rumors would break, like there was corruption. Uh, the local Mughal officials were to a certain extent, cracking down the East India Company. Uh, but at other points, they were accepting bribes. It was a very messy situation. Uh, Matthias Vincent, who was the governor of the Bengal Agency before Hedges, he was accused of pretty much blatant corruption. Sir William Hedges arrives. Sir William Hedges is a great businessman. He knows what he's doing with business. He is terrible with people. He made everybody in the company that was there angry long before he even tried to make his move against Matthias Vincent. And by the time he did, Matthias Vincent already had armed guards ready. They ran him out of India. Uh, Sir William had just spent several years pretty much having an adventure to get back to England. And when he did in 1688, he was knighted by then King James II. Now, let's get back to 1682 when... Sir Josiah Child, the governor of the East India Company, he's fed up at this point, and he, he wants the East India Company to be the primary group that the primary group from Europe that the Mughals will go to for trade with Europe. So no Portuguese, no Dutch, no Spanish. He wanted, they wanted the East India Company to be number one. To make that happen, he decides that they're going to go to war against the Mughal Empire. Like I said before, Aaron Zeb was building the army. He was modernizing it. When we're talking, like, most of the images that we'll depict are, you got the shield, you got swords. This continues in the 19th century, but the Mughal Empire also had firearms. Some of them were made from European parts, some of them were made domestically, and they were very good quality. They had cannons. Some of these cannons were made out of multiple metals. Some of the stuff that they had experimented with in Europe earlier in the 17th century and had failed at. Under Aronzeb, it was working. They were Their cannons were amazing. Spoilers to later on. Well, I, not this video. Video coming up probably about the fourth video, maybe. Hint, hint. Quality was good. 1685, Admiral Nicholson is dispatched by the East India Company. Keep in mind, this is a company sending an army <laughs> and a navy. 12 ships, 200 cannon, 600 men, and then when they arrived, they got 400 men from Madras, which is modern Chennai. They were pretty successful at first, but then in 1686, they were forced to withdraw, and they withdrew through a swamp. Over the next three months... 50% of the English sailors and soldiers would die of disease. In 1688, they decided to blockade the harbor where the pilgrims were leaving for Mecca. Now, again, Aaron Zeb is very, he's a very devout Muslim. He, wa he, needs, he, he wants the pilgrimage to happen. I'm, the Hajj was not only a religious rite, it was also very economic. It was where you would it's where you'd make a lot of your business contacts. As I said in the previous video, this needed to happen. This was crucial for Mughal trade as well as religion. So he agrees 
to a treaty. The new commander, Captain Heath, ignores the treaty. Aaron Zeb's already pretty angry at this point. So, he seizes all the East India Company factories, with the exceptions of Bombay, modern Mumbai, and Madras. And in 1689, a combined Mughal and Ethiopian Empire fleet blockaded Bombay. They, they cut it off from the outside world to the point that they couldn't even leave the factory. The people in the factory were starving. They, they ran out of resources. Messages, of course, were getting back to the East India Company. I mean, this was, this was a big... When it comes to investing, this was like, this was the equivalent of... You know, I'm not going to give any modern equivalents, but think of times recently where suddenly companies that were very successful suddenly had a major drop in stock prices. This is a great example right here. In 1690, the East India Company agrees to stop the war and beg for forgiveness. And when I say beg, I mean that literally. The representatives went to Agra, laid on the ground, and begged Aurangzeb for forgiveness. And they paid 1,500,000 rupees. The company did not get the exclusive rights of trade. A lot of it went back to the status quo. They were allowed to set up a new factory in Calcutta, modern Kolkata. <music> Meanwhile, back in London, actually back in time at this point, in 1660, of course, the Stuart dynasty is restored, with Charles II becoming king. His brother, the Duke of York, later James II, he gets together some investors, and they decide to form the Royal African Company. They were going to have a monopoly in West Africa the same way as the East India Company had their monopoly in India. Instead of being based in factories, they'd be based in forts, such forts as Cape Coast Castle, Witta, names that come up throughout the Golden Age of Piracy. Their primary trade items were gold, silver, ivory, and people. The Dutch were the original slave traders to the New World. And then with the Navigation Acts, which I will get into next, the East India, the Royal Africa Company took over. They were poorly run in the beginning. They went through several name changes, but it was still the same lineage of the company. It kept going on throughout into the 18th century. In 1672, as the Royal African Company of England, they were given the ability to maintain troops, and they had martial law around their area. Now, they were business. They were not... They didn't go out and kidnap people. They would hire other people to do it for them, usually the local leaders. If the local leaders went to war, and they brought back prisoners, people they captured from the villages, they would buy them. In the 1680s, the Royal, Afri Royal African Company was exporting 5,000 people per year. Many of them in the 1670s and the 1680s were branded with D-O-Y for Duke of York. Let's talk about the Navigation Acts. In 1651, during the Commonwealth under Oliver Cromwell, Navigation Acts were passed. When Charles II was restored in 1660, the Navigation Acts were broadened. It was designed to protect English trade with her colonies. No foreign ships were allowed to be used. They had to be English ships, and 75% of the crew had to be English. This also applied to the East India Company. So, this is going to become relevant later on because, it, let's say, a large number of sailors died during the voyage to India, they couldn't replace them. They couldn't hire anybody locally. Almost all trade items had to go back to England before they went to the New World. That was it with the exception of tobacco, which could only be grown in Virginia and Barbados. You could actually be fined for growing tobacco in England. They were that serious about the monopolies. 
wool was not allowed to be exported in its raw form and wool producing tools so anything you'd use for wool production was not allowed to be sold outside of England they wanted to make sure that everybody in the English sphere of influence was using English wool I think this might be where some reenactors get confused about fabrics we'll get to that so some of the other exceptions were so salt that was going to the New England fisheries for cod that could go straight there Madeira wine could go straight to the New World servants from Scotland and Ireland they go to New World horses from Scotland could also go to the New World and slaves typically went directly to the New World there was also a part where you weren't allowed to trade in coins to other countries. That was removed in 1663 with pressure from East India Company lobbyists. Coinage was what the Mughals and even China tended to trade with. They wanted the coins. They didn't want tobacco, things like that. They wanted gold and silver. There was also bans on coinage in the New World. So in 1652 Massachusetts decided to start issuing the pine tree shilling they would continue issuing that even after 1652 periodically but they would all be dated 1652 so they could always say you know this was old production this isn't something we just we just made no it's it's old it's kept in the box that's why it looks so fresh the colonies would have a lot of issues with coinage. It's why Spanish coins would still be the normal coinage even after the American Revolution. Almost everything that was imported had to be bought with metal coinage. It could be traded with tobacco, things like that. Tobacco was also used as an ad hoc currency at various points. Another option was built were bills of exchange. So let's say you didn't necessarily like you didn't necessarily want to give the coins away. You could here, here's I promise I'll give you this amount. Now this would be issued by governments, some merchants, and you could pass that bill of exchange on to others, and one day they could eventually go back and get the actual coinage if they needed it. Problem was a lot of these some of the companies, some of the governments, they were issuing more bills of exchange than coins that they had. This was leading to inflation. You can't, if you have a backed currency, you can't trade more of the paper than you have of the coins. This would get worse later on with the currency acts of 1751 and 1764, which would help lead to the American Revolution. But at this point in time, they had other sources. They had pirates. That's why pirates were tended to be celebrated at this point in the American colonies. Pirates and smugglers. The Spanish at this time, if they were, if they wanted something in Spain, let's say they wanted porcelain or calico fabric, uh, silk fabric, they would take the coins that they would have processed from the mines in Central America, they would have taken them across the Pacific to Asia, they would have got what they needed, brought it back, brought it back to the New World, and it would have passed through the Caribbean all the way to Spain. Well, across the Atlantic, from the Caribbean all the way to Spain. And that is how their trade worked. That is also how, when pirates and buccaneers would attack Spanish ships in the Caribbean. That's how we have things like porcelain and a samurai sword at Port Royal. It, didn't, it wasn't directly from Asia. It had crossed through Central America, Mexico, etc. This is how some of these trade items were making it into the New World outside of the monopoly. So even though there was a ban on, let's say, shipping calico directly, people were getting it. That, that was the hint to reenactors. <laughs> there are several accounts of fabric, cotton fabric, silks, etc. being taken by pirates in this time period in the Caribbean. Let's move on. 
got done filming and I realized I kind of brushed over the topic a little bit. I, I don't like brushing over things like this, uh, especially given how important a lot of this dialogue is. So when we're talking about the we're talking about the Royal African Company, they were responsible for shipping more slaves than any other group. So during the entire North Atlantic slave trade, they were the num they were the top one. Like I said, a lot of their interactions were with local leaders. But that said, there were also what we call interlopers. Interlopers in this in this case, yeah, they might trade with local chieftains, but they were also the ones where we get the stories of they left some things on the beach and then they were tricking people onto the ships. This actually happened. There's going to be a pirate I'm going to talk about later on that did just this specific thing. We, a lot of times in the modern world, we're kind of isolated from what was happening in this time period, why it was so awful. Owning people on itself is awful. What was happening, people were being treated like products. The only reason anybody actually made it across the Atlantic was because they were being treated like merchandise. You had the brands. You also had such things I have replicas of because being a pirate, doing events discussing the prison system, doing events where slavery becomes a topic. These are leg irons. Now, you might have two on you. You might have just one. Just one of these, you could connect two people together. That is how they were used. There's a find off the coast of Florida of an actual slave ship, an English slave ship. These were being used for two people. When we talk about the Middle Passage, we a lot of times will see some of the later ships where people are just cramped together. That was, that was what would happen. People would be sick. People would be starving. Yes, even though they are, they're being fed the bare minimum. Because a lot of these ships, when I was talking about crews earlier, cruise size, number one, they wanted to, they were trying to make sure that they didn't have to pay that many people. So a lot of these ships were very efficient. It's why the pirates were, that's why we have the Queen Anne's Revenge, the Widda, these were very efficient ships. They were fast, and they didn't need that many people to man the rigging. So when we're talking about these ships, there's only a handful of crew members actually on board. It comes up about how easy it was to take Queen Anne's, well, La Cacord, the Witta. They didn't have that many crew members. So they were feeding the people on the ship bare minimum. Just enough to keep them alive. This is what was happening. The reason they were, you might only have one of these on, stop infection. Having both of these on, you would have had a higher risk of infection. This wasn't, this wasn't meant to, this was a good thing. No, this was not a good thing. This was, they were trying to keep their, what they saw as products alive. When we're talking about this time period, when I said at the very first video, there's very few good people in this time period. I mean that. <laughs> this was considered normal. I've been asked a few times if, about, like, what were pirates' views on slavery. I, Golden Gunpowder did a pretty excellent video. Uh, nothing against it at all. It's excellent. There, to be honest, I don't think a lot of pirates saw a moral problem. I don't think many people did see a moral problem. As modern people looking at it, oh yes, you should see a moral problem with it. At that time period, a lot of people did not. This was considered normal. Again, there were a few who started speaking out early on. Uh, it was actually one of the, I, 
I don't know if I mentioned it in the Pennsylvania video, but that was actually one of the Anabaptists' big complaints against the Quakers. Like, how can you claim to be being simple, practicing in God's image, whenever you're participating in the slave trade? So, I'm hoping this... I normally don't like being as... We need to talk about this, but this is one of the things we do need to talk about. As we get further into this video series, I hope you understand, yes, pirates are awesome. They're an excellent vehicle for teaching 17th century history. I'm sure there's a lot of you who would not give a hoot about 17th century economics, but this is a pirate channel. You love to study pirates, and that is awesome. Some of the fictional ones are amazing. Some of the historical ones weren't really that bad. I mean, Sam Bellamy, from what I've read, he wasn't that bad of a person. But, <laughs> the large majority of them, wouldn't call them immoral, I would call them amoral. But that is something that a lot of people in this time period were. So, be careful on how you use your modern lens when, dis when thinking about them, discussing them. Realize that there's a large, there's millions of people that they don't have, made, like some of, I've met plenty of people where, well, my so-and-so, such-and-such great-grandfather was supposedly this person. A lot of people don't have that because of this whole enterprise. They don't have that sort of family tree. Uh, great example, uh, especially with what I'm going to be getting into later, there's a lot of people who have done genetic research. Turns out they're from Madagascar. That's where their ancestors came from. If you look at the official documents, well, there, there's no way. How could their families be from Madagascar? Royal African Company didn't work with them. Somebody else did. Let's move on to New Amsterdam. Specifically, a man by the name of Frederick Flipson. Frederick Flipson had moved to New Amsterdam likely in the 1650s, maybe 60s. Uh, he had started out by selling nails, allegedly. I mean, that's, that's how poor they say he was. He was selling iron nails. And then he ended up being able to sell taverns. He married a wealthy widow. He was an excellent businessman. He knew how to take money and make more money with it. In 1674, when New Amsterdam became New York, Frederick Flipson pledged allegiance to the English crown and became Frederick Phillips. His land would end up stretching from roughly modern-day Yonkers all the way up to about Sleepy Hollow. And it would be in his family up until the American Revolution when it was seized because they were loyalists. So, any of you who are familiar with Phillips Manor, this is the guy we're talking about. This is the guy who founded it. Uh, Phillips Manor also has a great program for some of what I'm talking about. So, definitely, I'm, I really want to check out that site eventually, given how much I've read about Phillips. This is only a tiny bit about his life and some of the awful things he was involved in. So, Frederick Phillips... Again, he's good at making money. He also decides that he can get slaves a lot cheaper on his own than through the Royal African Company. He sent his own ship to Angola and brought back 50 people. It's the first time he was an interloper. It wasn't the last. He ends up, at this point in time, got a letter from a certain Adam Baldridge. Adam Baldridge had escaped a murder charge in Jamaica. Adam Baldridge settled in St. Mary's in Madagascar. He was setting up a trading post. He was basically what he was doing. He would sell goods to pirates, passing merchants, anybody who needed them. 
take the money, and he would, and also sometimes items, and he would trade with the local Malagasy chiefs. So if they go to war to capture slaves, he would buy slaves, and then he was looking for somebody to sell them. That's how he got in touch with Frederick Phillips. Frederick Phillips sent a ship full of trade items, and apparently Adam Baldridge didn't send him as near as many slaves as he wanted. Frederick Phillips naturally was unhappy, but he knew a good deal when he could find one. Yeah, this process would continue for many years. We're going to get more into this as we go along. Uh, this is the base of operations for many of the pirates that we are going to talk about. Uh, Frederick Phillips later on lost his position in the governor's executive council, but he kept his land. It was found out that he was an interloper. Uh, we start to see a lot more of crackdowns against colonial officials under William III, who at this point is now the king. His government, they start to actually pay attention to the corruption. I'm going to leave you there. Hope you enjoyed today's video. Uh, this is about my third time filming it. I feel like every time I was filming it, there would be something going on that would just, just ruin the whole mood of it. Uh, if you enjoyed it, please like, share, subscribe, comment. If you didn't like it, tell me why. Comment. Just I want to get this algorithm moving. Uh, next video, we are going to start talking about the pirates, such as Thomas II, a few others. It's going to be... I, I'm interested to see how long the series will go. There's been a lot of new scholarship on some of the pirates, and very happy to get a lot of it out here. Uh, at some point, there is going to be there's going to be a few other videos interspersed. Uh, I'm on a planning stage of one that I'm hoping I can make the announce. I'm hoping I can announce what this video is going to be, but. I gotta let a friend that's got an amazing Facebook page make his own announcement first. I'm just gonna put that out there. Very excited for this project. So, uh, again, take care. You wanna get into piracy? Visit us on Facebook. Uh, we actually have a price list. So, take care. Have an awesome week.